Okay, so even as uh, people log in, I think um, uh, it's time to uh, get started. So, um, uh, Dr. Rao, uh, can we sort of commence? Are you okay? Good to go? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, so, good evening, esteemed colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Venigala Rao, who is joining us from Washington, D.C., United States of America, for this inaugural address of the esteemed speaker series. The great philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do not follow where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. That best describes our founder, Barrister Sri Dayanand Sagar, journalist, cinema, aficionado, politician, philanthropist, and most of all, educationalist, a visionary in whose honor we gathered here under the ages of the Sagar Centenary Celebrations. May I now invite our Honorable Pro-Vice Chancellor, Dayanand Sagar University, and Senior Vice President, the DSI Group, Professor Janardhan, to address us, please, briefly, before we go over to Dr. Rao. Janardhan, sir, are you there? Okay, I sort of don't um, um, see him here at the moment. He was logged in, uh, maybe the rain in Bengaluru. Um, uh, Dr. Prakash, uh, sir, would you like to say a few words before we kick off? Yes, sir. Thank Good you. evening to all the participants for today's uh, Saga Centenary webinar series. Dr. Venigala Rao the invited speaker for today's webinar, and all my esteemed colleagues, as you know, July 24th, 2021, we launched Sagar Centenary Celebrations. The celebrations would go on for the whole year, and it will culminate on 24th, July, 2022. Today, we have with us Dr. Vengila B. Rao, where we are launching esteemed speaker series. There are many more talks from distinguished individuals, which we will be intimating timely. I, on behalf of uh, management of Dayanand Sagar institutions, Dr. Hemchandra Sagar and Dr. Premchandra Sagar, thank Dr. Rao for making time to be part of Sagar Centenary Celebrations and more so launching the speaker series, esteemed speaker series. And I, I also thank all my colleagues, students and the invitees who have taken part in today's Sagar Centenary esteemed speaker series. May I request Captain Nagra Subrao to introduce Dr. Rao to all the participants, and then we can go over to Dr. Rao. Go over to Captain Nagra Subram. Thank you, sir. Thank so you. That was, uh, that was Dr. CPS Prakash, Principal Dayanand Sagar College of Engineering and uh, very senior faculty uh, in the engineering school. So it is an honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Rao. Um, he is a much recognized person. Dr. Venigala B. Rao is a professor of biology and founding director of the recently established Bacteriophage Medical Research Center at the Catholic University of America, United States of America. After obtaining his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science here in Bangalore in 1980 and postdoctoral research at the University of Maryland Medical School, Dr. Rao joined the Catholic University of America in 1989 as an assistant professor in the Department of Biology, where he established the bacteriophage T4 research laboratory. He served as department chairman between 2001 to 2019, over a span of 18 years, as director of Center for Advanced Training in Cell and Molecular Biology since 1997. 
Dr. Rao's passion has been to learn everything possible about bacteriophage T4 virus and harness the basic knowledge into biomedical applications. He established a multidisciplinary research program that includes virology, biochemistry, structure, biophysics, immunology, and vaccinology in collaboration with the top investigators across the United States. Among his research accomplishments are more than 120 publications, most in high profile journals, 23 patents, 23 PhD graduates with 15 of them receiving distinction, solving the first atomic structure and functional map of viral DNA, packaging motor, and designing a dual anthrax plague biodefense vaccine. Dr. Rao was awarded the first Faculty Research Achievement Award when it was instituted by CUA in 2009 and was elected in 2021 to the prestigious fellowship in the American Academy of Microbiology, the honorific leadership group within American Society for Microbiology. Further, the American Society for Microbiology recognized Dr. Rao in 2020 as part of the National Public Health Initiative. Along with five other researchers, Dr. Rao was featured in a series of profiles of public health professionals on the front lines fighting COVID-19. Professor Rao and his bacteriophage T4 lab have been nominated for the 2021 Molecular Cloud Distinguished Research Award, which is sponsored by the biotechnology company GenScript. The award recognizes outstanding researchers and research achievements in the field of genome editing. Um, thank you very much. And before I hand over to Dr. Rao to take it forward, I would like to welcome uh, our Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Professor Janardhan, who has just joined us. Um, so Dr. Rao, over to you, please. And uh, uh, let's sort of uh, get commenced. You're on mute, sir. Always do this. Okay, thank you, namaste. Um, I uh, thank, uh, good evening. Um, First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dean Nagaraj Subrao uh, for inviting me to share our research with you today as part of Sri Dayananda Sagar University's centenary celebration. I'm honored to be part of this event. Uh, today, I will share with you uh, our experiences in designing a COVID vaccine. Let me share the screen. So let's see. Could anybody, everybody see the screen okay? Yes, doctor. Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so I'll share with, uh, with you our experiences uh, in designing a COVID vaccine using bacteriophage T4. Uh, what is bacteriophage uh, T4? Or simply phage T4. So these are some of the questions that I would be touching upon uh, in, this, in this talk. So bacteriophage T4. Um, it is a virus that infects E. coli. Uh, it's E. coli is a bacterium that resides in the GI tract of all of us. It's a, what you see is a beautiful virus. Um, it is a real reconstruction, atomic level reconstruction of the virus. Uh, although colors are coded to distinguish various components of the virus. Um, it has a, it's a, it's a large virus as viruses go. Uh, it has a head uh, the size of 120 by 86 nanometers, within which about 170,000 genetic codes of genetic information are packaged. It also has a very complex tail structure that is, it uses to uh, inject the genetic material into its host cell, host bacterium. Uh, the way it does here, it, it gives a, um, just a overview of the genetic program um, that uh, 
uh, that the virus uses. Here you see a virus, it's a cartoon picture of course, virus injecting its genetic material that triggers a series of um, internal events. Essentially, the virus uses the bacterial cell as a factory to manufacture viruses, the progeny viruses. It does replicate the combination assembly and so forth. Eventually, um, about the, the cell would be loaded with the, with the particles. About 200 viruses are produced and the cell is, will burst open releasing these particles. And these viruses now can infect um, healthy E. coli cell to start the infection process again. Um, so it's all of this, literally hundreds of thousands of reactions are taking place inside the cell once infection is initiated. All of this takes place in about 20, 25 minutes. It's a very efficient replicating machine. Um, let me use the pointer here. Yeah. So uh, what got us into the COVID vaccine design is our about more than 30 years of bacteriophage research at the Catholic University. Uh, most of our research uh, is basic research, primarily designed to understand uh, how the virus assembles, what is its structure, uh, what's the mechanism by which it packages genome inside the capsid. It actually packages so tightly that there is a large amount of internal pressure due to the tightly packed DNA. In fact, the pressure is estimated to be about five times the pressure in a champagne bottle. So there are a lot of basic molecular biology that we, we have uh, been trying to learn. And at the same time, we are harnessing some of that knowledge for biomedical applications, uh, for example, vaccines, phage therapy, I mean, phage therapy, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, and so on. So um, the, well, I, I'm going to show you four video clips that summarize some of the discoveries that we have made over the past 30 years or so. This is really basic molecular mechanisms um, at various, for various aspects of the virus life cycle. Here is a video clip that answers the question, question how does T4 infect E. coli bacteria? Uh, this is, as I said, quite a lot of structural data, biochemical data combined to generate the video animation. It's actually quite realistic. So as you can see, the virus lands on the E. coli bacterium by recognizing certain molecules, very specific molecules on this particular bacterium. That is how it recognizes a specific host cell. Once it does, it, the whole thing unravels, leading to the delivery of genetic material into the E. coli bacterium. It literally drills a hole into the bacterial envelope to release the genetic material. The next question is, how does the virus assemble? We found that there is a, uh, more, there is a structure called portal um, with a 12 subunit ring structure that is the initiation point for the assembly of the bacterial phages. As you can see here, this is the ring structure I'm talking about with a central hole through which genetic material is transported into the capsid. And, and eventually the whole capsid subunits, uh, like you see here surrounding it, will assemble and produce a uh, capsid structure and, and the DNA is transported through this ring and also delivered when it infects an E. coli bacterium. What is the structure of the capsid? And here is the beautiful atomic structure of the virus capsid. Uh, it is made up of one capsid subunit, primarily 930 of these molecules forming this entire capsid with some additional proteins. Uh, in fact, the blue molecules that are, you see kind of fibrous molecules that are sticking out, they're called HOC, uh, highly antigenic outer capsid proteins. And there are these green subunits called SOC, small outer capsid proteins. 
these molecules are part of the structure, but they are not really essential for, for virus assembly. So we exploit these molecules to engineer and do virus mimicry so that we can produce vaccines and gen therapeutics and so on. And the final clip is the, how does it package the genetic material inside the capsule? It's a fascinating story, actually. We spent most of our time trying to understand this mechanism. And here you see, this is the capsid. Uh, and, and we discovered that there is a molecular machine, nanoscale molecular machine called the packaging motor that brings the genetic material, the DNA, and attaches to the capsid through this portal that I just talked about and utilizes the fuel, fuel heap molecule here is ATP. And this ATP hydrolysis provides the energy to pump the DNA. It's like a five cylinder engine uh, transporting, pumping the DNA like a piston in, so into the capsid until it is completely full. So these are some of the molecular mechanisms that we have uh, understood over the years that allowed us to uh, work on um, applications of this knowledge to uh, various biomedical uh, applications. And, and the one application I would talk about today is viral mimicry. And if you didn't remember any of my, of my details of my talk, one thing that you may want to keep in mind uh, of the main message for, for this talk is viral mimicry. What we do is we would use our engineer our virus so that it would mimic another pathogen, in this case, COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2. What we do is we take the bare bone virus right here. There is no hawk or sock on the surface of the capsid, but then we would engineer hawk and sock so that these molecules would be displayed. Uh, it's like the our virus disguising like a pathogen, depending on the molecules we would engineer. Let's say if we want to make a COVID vaccine, we would take the genetic material from the COVID SARS-CoV-2 virus and incorporate it into our virus and, and then express these molecules on the surface so that the virus, although it is T4, in some respects, it would mimic the COVID-19 virus. And when these particles are given as a vaccine to humans or animals, then our immune system recognizes these as SARS-CoV-2 components and produces defense mechanisms, immune responses, and, and, and provide protection when the real virus actually, uh, we are exposed to the real virus. And this is the viral mimicry that we can use for uh, any other vaccine because it's a, like a platform technology. If we want to make a flu virus, we would incorporate flu genetic material. And in fact, we published a, a series of papers on uh, engineering our virus with uh, components from anthrax and plague and constructed an anthrax plague dual vaccine that completely protects animals against the, uh, these two deadly biothreat agents. Uh, in the recent, in a couple of years ago, recently, we have also incorporated CRISPR genome editing into our in, uh, vaccine delivery technology so that we can generate these recombinant viruses in an accelerated fashion. And that came in very handy for designing the COVID vaccine. So I'll, I should also mention a little bit about what's for our, our motivation to design the COVID vaccine. Um, and and uh, it was uh, late, uh, sometime in January or so, uh, it was very, personally, it was very distressing for me to uh, witness the uh, suffering uh, the virus is causing in, in Wuhan, China. Wuhan has a special place in my heart because many of my students and postdocs uh, came from Wuhan uh, University and, and some of them went back and are actually there in Wuhan. So um, we felt uh, was very upsetting to see that. And also as a virologist, it became 
obvious that this is a pandemic and it's not going to stay in Wuhan. At the time it was a lockdown in Wuhan. So it is going to spread all over the world. It is going to come to the United States. So we better do something about it. And, and as, I, as I mentioned, we have a technology that we have been developing and we get, I gathered a small research team that we have and, and I had a meeting and, and we basically decided to suspend all our research projects and then um, embark on the uh, COVID vaccine design. This was in late January, early parts of February when the uh, virus was pretty much restricted more or less to, the, uh, to Wuhan, China. So, uh, but there's a lot uh, going on uh, at the time uh, in terms of the virus spread there and, and also probably across the world, but we didn't know at the time. So I wrote to uh, Dr. Fauci, whom I know from our previous interactions with HIV vaccine design. And this is one of the emails I'm sharing with you because we needed the genetic material to begin our research. There are only few labs or maybe a couple of labs at the time having the viral genetic material. One is with uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, uh, heading the NIH uh, VRC Vaccine Research Center. So basically we were very much concerned about it. So this is one of the things that I would share with you considering the emergency situation and the enormous suffering the Wuhan virus, coronavirus is causing. We cannot sit by and do not do our part. Therefore, with minimal resources available to us, we have decided to go ahead and construct vaccine candidates, which will be ready for testing in about four weeks. This was in mid-February. And I have also contacted many other scientists who were, were in fact, there are a few who are directly involved, uh, Barney Graham from VRC and Kizzy Corbett. In fact, these two are the uh, key architects of the Moderna vaccine, and, and they have the genetic material. They have kindly sent us the genetic material that we received on March 9th of 2020. By March 17th, we have a detailed blueprint of how we would like to construct the T4 COVID vaccine using our technology. This is the, basically the, uh, the, the, a copy of the, the first draft of the blueprint that we have constructed at the time. Keep in mind that uh, we, other groups are also working on the vaccine, but nobody knows. We didn't even have the assays, challenge models. We are starting from scratch and nobody knows whether any of these vaccines would work. All we wanted to do was to do our part to contribute to this uh, upcoming uh, emerging pandemic. So you see a lot of flags here and arrows and so forth. The flags represent some of the milestones in the vaccine design. And there are arrows where we have many backup strategies because we did not know which one would, would actually uh, provide uh, protect production and, and work effectively. Uh, intense work had begun in March, mid-March. Uh, then immediately soon after that, the virus, you know, not surprisingly, uh, was in the United States and, and really uh, exploding. And there was complete lockdown. And there was a time uh, that we, it was a scary time, obviously, especially for the students and postdocs working in the lab. So there was a, there was a time where they were so, so, in fact, we were so, so scared to actually stop the work for a couple of weeks because everything was locked down and, and, and uh, there were many uncertainties. And there was a possibility that the university will completely shut down, which means we have to stay in the university and not get out and, and stay there for probably weeks, if not months. But we decided at the end to stick to our plan and, and uh, uh, proceed with our work. And while the, all this is going on, we were, at least the students and postdocs in the lab were working 12, 14 hours days, seven days a week to get this thing going. Because as, as I said, we started literally from the scratch getting the genetic material from, from VRC. So I'll, I'll give you some unique features of our vaccine. Um, most, in fact, all, almost all of the current vaccines are focused on a single molecule, the spike protein as the vaccine target. And we, of course, also focus on uh, spike protein. 
but we also our our technology is such that it would allow incorporation of multiple components of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and and this is a, a cartoon uh, model of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And in addition to sp spike, we could incorporate uh, envelope protein, nucleocapsid protein, membrane protein. They are all part of the uh, our vaccine, and they are also important. These are structural components for the virus and important for uh, for generating broad and robust protection compared to using just one component that is the target for almost all the vaccines. It also, our vaccine also will have no adjuvants, no strong chemicals that would be used in our vaccine formulation. How do we construct? I will go through very briefly in a very, very broad, uh, high level uh, outline. We take the source uh, COVID-2 genetic material corresponding to spike um, and uh, uh, envelope membrane, nucleic acid protein. We construct recombinant plasmids. Uh, you, you, show where, you see various colors corresponding to these uh, COVID-19 components and, and, and then uh, incorporate these plasmids into the E. coli host bacterium uh, for our virus and infect with our virus. And while it in, replicates inside E. coli, it picks up some of the uh, COVID-19 genetic material and incorporates it into its own. And so by using many different plasmids, we can generate uh, vaccine candidates that can be tested in animal studies and then select the best one that provides the uh, highest uh, uh, protection. So using this uh, basic uh, uh, approach, uh, we uh, incorporated the SARS-CoV-2 genes into T4 genome. Here is a T4 genome genetic map. This is a very technical side. You don't really need to really understand much except to know that we identified four sites in our viral genome that are shown in arrows where we could incorporate various genetic materials from SARS-CoV-2 so that we will have a recombinant virus now expressing uh, the COVID-19 components. By iterative processing using CRISPR engineering, we could construct a variety of components in various combinations of this genetic material. You see here various colors representing combinations of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 uh, materials expressed on T4. And we tested, we literally constructed a couple of hundred clones actually and tested, uh, selected them and then tested a dozen of those and, and found out one of the candidates showing the highest protective efficacy and that became our vaccine. And I'm going to show you a video clip that describes the various components of our T4 COVID vaccine. Uh, we take the virus, uh, which uh, strip it off of the other components except the, the, the backbone, and then we do various manipulations. Uh, first, we would insert COVID-2 genes uh, into the phage genome. As you can see here, uh, again showing different colors, this be now becomes part of the T4 viral genome. We then incorporate uh, nucleocapsid uh, protein, express them and incorporate nucleocapsid proteins uh, that you uh, see here. I'm sorry, there is a problem here. Um, let me... Let me start here. So you will see um, the blobs here inside those. You may or may not be able to see those are nucleocapsid proteins packaged in our virus. And we also have enolap. These red blobs that you see are the COVID-19 COVID enolap component. And finally, we have incorporated the spikes. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spikes on the surface of the capsid. So essentially, our virus is now decorated both inside and outside with the 
uh, COVID-19 viral components. And we generate these nanoparticles that are all incorporated into the same nanoparticle structure. And we then tested these in uh, using a mouse model. Let me see. Uh, in a mouse model where we could um, in, in, immunize mice with these with these particles and uh, isolate, you know, get the blood and, and sera and do various immunological assays. This is by October 20, that is within about six months uh, of, uh, or six to seven months since we actually started the work, we actually immunized the mice and actually generated the sera for testing the immunological analysis. What we found was, I, I'll, I'll go over a few pieces of the data. Um, we found strong spe spike specific antibody titers, about a million or so, as you can see the histograms here, I won't go into many details, but these are very specific assays that detect the antibodies that are specific for SARS-CoV-2 virus that were generated using our vaccine. We also found that these antibodies block the virus interaction with the host cells. Uh, this is a control where you see a fluorescence, meaning the virus could enter the cells, but in the presence of our antibodies produced by the vaccine, there is no fluorescence. That means virus could not enter the cells. Uh, importantly, the vaccine produced strong virus neutralizing antibodies, about 5,000 titers. We have CDC approved virus to determine, to do these virus titers. And, and finally, uh, a significant point is that unlike most other vaccines, in fact, unlike all other vaccines, our vaccine actually produces not only spike specific antibodies, but also nuclear capsid protein specific, as well as annular specific antibody titers, which means it has broad immunity against the uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, do this, uh, we have confirmed this in a rabbit study. We did basically the same experiment in the, in the rabbit uh, uh, model as well. And, uh, and found that the uh, vaccine generates very high uh, uh, COVID-19 specific antibody titers, as well as virus neutralization titers. Actually, the virus neutralization titers are about four times greater in the rabbits when compared to the uh, mice. Do these antibodies provide protection against challenge? So far, what we have I have shown you are the immune responses, but they, do they actually protect if these animals are immunized, or sorry, challenged with the live lethal virus? So we were in a pretty <laughs> difficult situation because in our facility, there is no challenge model. We don't have the biosafety level three facility that is needed to, to do this. So we have to ship our, at the time we started, we had no challenge model. Nobody had challenge model, but during the course of the time, challenge model has been developed uh, in University of Texas uh, medical, uh, medical Branch in Galveston. And I have a collaborator, longtime collaborator there, Ashok Chopra. And we talked and he said, why don't you ship the animals? Uh, to UTMB so that he can test uh, the efficacy by challenging with the lethal virus. So that was a pretty logistical, you know, pretty difficult logistical nightmare because no good animal facility would accept animals from a different facility uh, for various regulatory reasons and so forth. But now finally we managed to do that and test the, uh, our animals by challenging with a lethal strain of SARS-CoV-2. And we found that um, um, uh, the T4 COVID vaccine uh, provides complete protection against lethal COVID challenge. And I'll give you a few pieces of data. This is the control where we injected just the backbone virus without any COVID comp components. The mice actually upon challenge, uh, they all lose weight very quickly. By day fifth, they lost about 20, 25% of the body weight. 
And that's a very large amount of loss in such a short period of time. And 80% uh, of them actually, uh, okay, before coming to that, whereas the vaccinated mice, there are two groups where there is a slight dip in the weight, but they all maintain the weight. There is no uh, significant uh, loss in the weight. And when we look at the survival, 80% of the control mice with the backbone immunization, uh, they die. Uh, only 20% survive when they regain uh, the weight afterwards. Whereas the, the vaccinated mice, all 100% of them are completely protected. So with that information we, uh, we have, we have since then, since that time conducted three additional mouse studies and actually found an intranasal needle-free vaccine is even more effective than the intramuscular vaccine because intranasal uh, vaccination produced mucosal antibodies in lungs. Therefore, it has much uh, more beneficial effect to uh, protect uh, against uh, lung pathology. It also produced strong neutralizing antibodies as well as T cell immunity, which is important for long-term protection. And of course, complete protection against lethal challenge once again in these studies, and no significant viral loads were detected upon virus challenge, which means likely, although we don't know for sure at this point, it's likely that uh, there is minimal virus shedding upon challenge, meaning it is possible that the virus is effective because it has mucosal antibodies and will have uh, will, will reduce or block the transmission of the virus to other individuals. But these are ongoing studies. We, we have not uh, completed these studies yet. So where are we now and where we are going? Uh, as I mentioned, we have a needle-free, edge-free T4 COVID vaccine. Um, I has, as, as I have already ma mentioned, it has broader and more robust protection because it can produce antibodies, immune responses against spike, and as well as the nucleocapsid protein, which is a very important target for T cell immunity, for broad immunity. So therefore, um, they, the vaccine is expected to be cross-protective against the variants and the future uh, emerging coronaviruses. Um, it is adjuvant free, no chemicals are used as, as uh, used in other vaccines, although these are not dangerous chemicals, but they do cause some side temporary reactions. And like the J&J AstraZeneca vaccines, there is no infectious viral material. It is stable and inexpensively, relatively inexpensive, inexpensively manufactured. So these are some of the useful characteristics that um, are, are, uh, can be exploited to, de uh, to develop, manufacture this vaccine. Uh, we have uh, now collaboration. In fact, the technology has been licensed to adaptive phage therapeutics, a uh, Maryland company in this area. Uh, funded by Defense Health Agency, um, uh, part of DOD. Uh, they are manufacturing, GMP manufacturing the uh, vaccine and preparing an FDA IND application for approval to take it to the clinic for phase one uh, human clinical trials. Uh, the potential applications are, um, it could be used as a, as a booster vaccine um, or an approved second generation vaccine. Keep in mind, the current vaccines are not yet approved vaccines. They are uh, emergency use authorization. Uh, it, they have to go through more, much more safety and other criteria before it can be approved. And as you all know, uh, most of the global population still remain vaccinated. Uh, and in fact, almost all the children remain uh, unvaccinated at this point. So there is a desperate need to generate uh, vaccines uh, that are uh, that generate broad immunity, because as you all know, the variants are emerging at a faster rate now and causing um, um, additional uh, explosion of the cases 
uh, in many countries, for instance, the Delta variant, which originated in, in India, now spread all over the world. In fact, 93% uh, of the current new cases in the United States are due to the Delta variant, which is more transmissible and more lethal uh, than the original uh, strain. And, and most of the vaccines are have diminished the efficacy against this variant. And in fact, there are numerous breakthrough infections that are coming out uh, against, you know, because of this virus. So we really need, desperately need uh, more vaccines, stable, safe vaccines that can be distributed globally. And we are working very hard to uh, push uh, all the studies. This is a new platform. So we have a lot more um, uh, not more barriers, so to speak, to cross in order to get the final approvals and so forth, unlike the current vaccines, which uh, have been in the system in the market uh, for quite a bit of time. So we are working very hard to generate this uh, needle-free, adjuvant-free uh, E. coli-based uh, phage vaccine. In fact, this would be the first, first phage vaccine ever uh, constructed. Um, to bring it out as quickly as possible uh, so that it would be, we would be able to, or the vaccine would be able to contribute to the uh, global efforts to finally put an end to this pandemic. So uh, I would like to thank, take a moment and thank the people who work really very, very hard. Uh, I, as I said, I have a small group of students and and research fellows. Uh, this is one of the old pictures, but I would like to point out the people who did all this work. Uh, the uh, postdoctoral fellow, Jingen Zhu here, and, and another postdoctoral fellow, Niti Anandaswamy. Uh, those are the two postdoctoral fellows, Wai Chun Tang, uh, Swati Jain, and Himanshu Batra. Those are graduate students. They actually graduated during the pandemic uh, they got their PhDs, but they decided to stay back in the lab as postdoctoral fellows to to contribute to this uh, to this effort. Ms. Isabel Nunes, who is an undergraduate student, who also is graduated as an undergraduate student, but really volunteered to help out with the animal studies. She took care of really all the animal care and so forth. Our provost, Mr. Ralph Albano, and facility staffs staff uh, during this process, uh, it is like, uh, believe it or not, everything that has that can break down did break down. So we had so many challenges during this process. Our facilities crew during the lockdown period have been extremely helpful to uh, come uh, bring us back to uh, back online and continue our studies. Uh, as I mentioned, Ashok Chopra and his colleagues have been very uh, helpful and uh, they have been instrumental to do the, all the challenge studies and the UTMB Galveston. And Sunil David, Virovax uh, in Kansas, he did the rabbit study and adaptive phage therapeutics. Uh, they are doing the current manufacturing and potentially to move it to manufacture in the near future after at least to clinic phase one studies and then potentially to manufacturing in the future. Uh, the work has been funded by National Institute of Health and National Science Foundation. We have been funded uh, by these two agencies for a long period of time. So here are our uh, T4 uh, 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 models that we keep in the lab, which always keep us reminded of why we are doing what we are doing. And uh, it's always, a great uh, inspiration to see and think and work uh, with this virus. And it has been 41 years since I started in the University of Maryland Medical School. So I thank you all for inviting me and listening to this talk. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rao. That was a fascinating uh, talk indeed into your research. Um, much of it, um, uh, okay, some of it went over my head, but I'm, I got the gist of what you were trying to say, and I'm sure my colleagues and students 
did too. So there are several questions. We'll try to answer some of them. We'll try. To, I'll try to put some of them to you, and then you can sort of. Uh, I hope you can answer them. Sure. Um, so 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 I think some of them are. I don't know whether Dr. Ashok here wants to say something. Uh, Dr. Ashok, you. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so I'll just go through the questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Shankar Deekshit uh, says the COVID vaccine taken, is it good enough to fight for life or, you know, do you need frequent vaccination as you go forward? Yeah, current vaccines, uh, the studies, uh, reported studies indicate they are good for eight to 10 months. Um, so very likely all of us would need a, either a booster vaccine or a second generation vaccine, which will have broader immunity. I mean, booster vaccine, all it would do is it would elevate the immune responses that we already have by boosting those responses, but they may not be sufficient against the variants. So therefore, it's hard to predict what the future is going to be. But one thing you can be sure that we all need another vaccine, either a booster or a second generation vaccine. To some extent, it depends on how the virus is evolving and how the vaccines are evolving. So we would wait and see. But currently, I think for now, um, we are okay. But in the months, maybe several months ahead, we'll be looking at taking another vaccine. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Professor Sachin Kumar, um, who's with the business school, he says that, how does this process take care of frequent mutation of the virus like SARS-CoV-2? Uh, I think he's talking about your process or whether you can come up with a vaccine, which will sort of take care of frequent mutations. Yeah. So the, uh, one of the things that... Um, uh, our one basic uh, aspect of our technology is incorporate more than one component. The emerging variants are all um, against the, the variations, the mutations in the spike region. There seem to be some background uh, uh, thing coming out. Uh, do you know, is, do you have that issue? Yeah, yeah, we have taken care of this. Okay, sorry. So, um, the variants are mutations in the spike gene. So vaccines that are primarily based on spike will have to, to evolve as the virus evolves. But that's why we incorporated a second component, the nucleocapsid component, doesn't, that, that doesn't change. Look at all these variants. If you look at the nucleocapsid, it doesn't change at all. Um, so therefore, if the vaccine has immune responses against the nucleocapsid, especially T cell responses, neutralizing antibodies are not very useful for nucleocapsid, but T cell responses, those are long lasting and those would be effective against all the variants. So that's why it's important to generate broad immunity, not only against this spike, but also against another important component like nucleocapsid, which is the structural component of the virus. So I think a, a, a next generation vaccine, whether it is ours or some, some other vaccine, would include another component most likely a nucleocapsid component that would provide broader immunity and cross protective against the, all the emerging variants. We are not there yet, but that's what we are heading towards. As long as we focus only on spike, I think we are going to have issues because the virus, there's so much virus reservoir out there and there's so much evolution going on at the same time because of that. Very nice. Um, thank you for that. Uh, this is a little from my colleague, uh, Dr. Venkatesh. It's a little politically loaded, so you can choose to ignore, um, but I will never, nevertheless ask it. Um, he says, doctor, is coronavirus a man-made synthetic one or natural virus? Is the current COVID spread a part of biological warfare? 
Okay, so uh, obviously I can only give my opinion. Um, uh, there's really very little hard data on this. Um, so uh, as, a, as a virologist and uh, you know, I can give my opinion. I, I can, I'm almost certain, uh, I should say, I'm certain I should say, actually nobody can be 100% certain, but I'm quite certain it is not biological warfare. I don't think it is created on purpose uh, as a biological weapon. I, we are not there yet. We are not that smart actually. Uh, so, but the keeping that out of it, whether it arose through some uh, unintentional uh, uh, outcome of certain experiments and it just escaped the, uh, the laboratory or it is just purely originated from the animal to human, uh, jumping from animal to human. I think that's a hard one to answer, but again, my opinion again here is that it's there, there are a higher probability that it is a, a, a perhaps a, an accidental um, outcome of, uh, of uh, in vitro evolution type of experiments that are being done. Because in order to jump from animal to human, it has to go through a natural process of evol evolution and intermediate host and so on and so forth. So the question, the, this is a real question. I mean, the opinions really do not count here. We really need to have hard data. Both are probabilities actually, uh, but which one is the correct one requires really hard experimental evidence, which we do not have. So there is no point in speculating on this. Uh, and somehow we have to get to the bottom of it. But I know it, is in, it involves a lot of other issues, political and otherwise, we would ever get to it or when we will get to it is, is an open question uh, because everybody has to cooperate with this and which currently it is not. And we have to have quietly think about and, and design experiments to, to get to that. So I would say, yeah, we, we really need, speculation is, is almost our opinions really don't count here. We really need to do the hard work. Right, um, thank you. Um, uh, so there are several questions and we really don't have the time, but this looks interesting. And it comes from uh, Shaumya Rai. And he says, Dr. Rao, which phase of testing is the vaccine currently in? That is, I, he's alluding to your vaccine. And when are we expecting this vaccine to be in the market? Is this to be taken annually as flu vaccine or is it a one-time shot? So, uh, yeah, I would like to have this vaccine to be out yesterday, obviously. You know, we have been working very, very hard towards that. Um, as I said, there is no phage vaccine ever. It's a new platform. We have been working on it at the research wise. Uh, so we have to jump through many, many hoops before it could uh, come out into the public use. Uh, we are moving towards phase one clinical trial, and we are going through the manufacturing and regulatory approvals with FDA and so forth. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that in 2022, uh, we will have the vaccine available. And if it does, it would be, again, my hope, we don't complete, have the complete set of data, but based on what we know and what we can predict with some reasonable uh, accuracy based on the evidence is that it would be a broadly effective vaccine. Uh, two shots of this perhaps would be sufficient for broad protection against many coronaviruses. So, but that is, uh, that is that is really a hope. So in 2022, I really hope that we will have the vaccine out um, and uh, make a difference. And this this pandemic is not going to go away anytime soon either. So I think we need to uh, keep up our efforts to get this thing done. So that sounds, um, that doesn't sound very well. This pandemic is not going to go away um, in the immediate future is what you said. and. Um, I think all of us can take note of that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rao. I will try to sort of also collate some of these questions and send them to you. And uh, when you have the time, if you can give us uh, brief answers, then I'll pass them back. 
Uh, but that was a fascinating talk. And I would like to invite, um, he's obviously having some uh, technical issues, our Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Janardhan, sir, Professor Janardhan, sir. Sir, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Can you give the closing remarks, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for me, um, what I uh, found it exciting was uh, um, Dr. Rao is surrounded by uh, a, a, a lot of uh, people from Asia, particularly if I could count about seven Indians in his team. It uh, brings us a lot of joy and uh, satisfaction. One, an Indian is leading such a great uh, initiative and uh, trying to solve a major, major problem that is thrown up by nature. Um, yeah, I would be happy if we could nail some country for that, uh, this, this cause, but now the top scientist says, uh, no, uh, it didn't happen by human beings. So it's, it's something which probably we, can, we give credit to an accident. We'll accept that, um, uh, Dr. Vinigala Rao, um, uh, your, your eminence, um, and probably will set to rest uh, the controversy. And I think this forum um, will, will take this one line message that this, this entire corona issue uh, is not man-made. Uh, we'll give the benefit of doubt to our, our neighboring country. Um, that's one. And uh, as I told, a um, number of Indians occupying key positions across the world brings, again, a lot of uh, you know, pride in us. And we want more uh, to happen. And uh, all the participants here, I saw one thing is, um, as the lecture was progressing, the numbers of participants kept on rising. Normally, it's the other way around. So it shows the seriousness and uh, the interest in this talk. So I think we should have more such uh, interactions with very eminent people. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for this illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Danan Sagar family, I acknowledge um, your immense contribution to science and to humanity and uh, to as a great motivator to a large number of scientists who are in this session. Uh, thank you, Captain Nagaraj Rao and all my other colleagues here who have made this event possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and uh, on behalf of the committee for convening the esteemed speaker series, uh, several of my colleagues, Dr. Rao, I thank you very much. Um, for being here this morning for you and evening for us. And thank you all the participants. We had more than 150 people uh, uh, who attended. And um, thank you for your time, patience, and attending this wonderful webinar brought to you by um, Dhanan Sagar uh, Group under the AGs of the Sagar Centenary Celebrations. And uh, I would once again like to thank Dr. Rao for making time uh, from his busy schedule. Thank you, sir and uh, good morning and we'll stay in touch yeah th thank you very much for inviting me thank you uh, chancellor janardhan and all the participants and uh, questioners i'll be happy to pass along my answers and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be part of your centenary celebrations and i wish the university all the best and i wish that uh, you will have great success in the centenary celebrations. And I also wish that uh, we'll make progress and eventually put this pandemic behind us. Each of us are doing our, our part in whatever ways we can. And that is the only way and the best way to, to address the current situation. So thank you all for, uh, for paying attention and, and uh, be part of this. Namaste. Namaste, Andy. <clears throat>